I will start the session recording now. Okay, so welcome all. Um, if you're new to the system um, and you haven't joined us before, we've been doing these Tuesday night and Thursday night sessions throughout lockdown. I think this is week 11 now. Um, tonight we're going to have a look at basic navigation and I've kept it simple. So we're going to do DR and EP, so dead reckoning nav and estimated positions tonight. And then on Thursday, we're going to have a look at course to steer. And I think one of the questions on one of the RYA instructors pages was around putting some leeway on. <clears throat> so I'm also going to show you a little bit about how you can apply leeway, particularly to the EPs today. OK, it is part of the um, uh, training bites that we've been doing. These are short 45 minute sessions. Um, just to cover one topic. So the idea is you can kind of do it in between, you know, perhaps having dinner and watching EastEnders or whatever it is that happens on a Tuesday night in your house. OK. And for those of you who don't know, I'm Kath Scott. I'm the chief instructor here in Portishead, Cooper C School. I'm also a Yacht Master Instructor Power and Advanced Power Boat Instructor. And I'm a lifeboat trainer assessor on the RNA Live boat here as well. So my background, small boats, big boats and sailboats. So hopefully I can appeal pretty much to all of you. If you have any questions as we go, if you want to pop them into the chat, I will try and um, pick them up as we go. Um, but I will open the session up for some questions. Um, but if I can have you on mute for now, that would be fab just so that it doesn't keep changing the speaker view. OK. Let me just pop another one in. There we go. OK, so um, this is what we're going to have a look at. A little bit of vision about position fixing. So it's position fixing and understanding what the chart symbols are, the symbols on, that you should be putting on there are and the lines and the arrows and so on and so forth. We'll have a look at converting compass bearings to magnetic bearing to true bearings. OK, um, so hopefully you've all got a pen and paper because there is a bit of a quiz in this one in the centre of the, the presentation. So I'm going to get you guys doing some of the work. Um, we're going to plot some dead reckoning. We're also going to look at plotting an estimated position and then how we can estimate and apply leeway to an EP. <clears throat> OK, so that's the system that we're going to have a look at today. OK. What I just want to do to start with is launch a quick poll about how confident you feel about your chart work skills. So you should have in front of you now a little box that's popped up. OK, so be honest, the 17 of you on there. Um, do you feel super confident? Um, you do it all the time, get it right every time. Confident, you kind of know what the symbols and lines mean and you mostly get stuffed in the right place. Not so confident, you find it a bit tricky to get everything in the right order, or not at all confident it's a complete mystery to you. So have a think. There's only going to be you guys and me seeing the answers. Obviously, there's no right answer to this. It's about how you feel. So we'll just give it, we've got 15 of 17. We've got a couple more to vote, and then I will close the poll and let's see where we have. Oof. Oof. But a few not so confident, it's all a mystery to me. Okay, so that's 17 of 17. So if I share the results with you, okay, so most of you are telling me that you're confident, you know what all the symbols and lines mean, and you get most of the drawings correct, which is nice. That's 10 of you, so 59%. Some of you not so confident, and some not at all confident. Nobody's super confident, okay? So we'll see by the end of it, maybe that will change. And maybe for those of you not at all confident, that might just bump you up one, okay? So we're going to start off with some basic symbology. OK, one of the sessions I did, oh gosh, weeks ago now was to talk about plotting our position, and how we can do that lap long. So we just need to think about what are the navigation symbols that we are going to use. So we've got our fix. We've got our waypoint on our EP, our estimated position. They are the navigation symbols that we are going to use. So our fix, a circle with a dot in it, our waypoint, a square with a cross through it and an estimated position as a triangle. It's all a little bit like a kid's television program. It's the round window, the square window, and the triangular window, okay? That's all we need to worry about, okay? So if we're looking at putting things on the ends of lines, where we fix a position or put an EP, it's a circle, a square, or a triangle. Today, we're gonna to be dealing with the fix and the EP, and on Thursday, we'll talk about using a waypoint for doing a course to stick. So then what are the lines that we're going to use? Well, we're going to be drawing our lines on our chart using our 2B pencils so that they can easily be uh, rubbed out. So our dead reckoning position is where we're not worrying about any tide, we're not worrying about any wind, we're not worrying about any leeway, we're just simply drawing a line and marking it off. Okay, so we would put our plotter on, we would draw the line and we would just simply mark it off how long we wanted the line to be. Okay. Then we deal with our water track, and this is where we start putting arrows onto our lines. So our water track is where we think the boat went, where it went through the water, okay? And that has one arrow on it. 
or ground track has two arrows on it. And this is if you were to trace a line underneath the boat, where did it actually go along the ground? Okay, if you were to go along the bottom of the sea, where would it actually have gone? And the easiest way I remember this is to say it's got two arrows and you would have two feet on the ground. Okay, so if you stood underneath your boat, you'd have the two arrows and you would have two feet on the ground. Okay, so that's the easiest way I remember it. We also have our tidal set and drift, and that always has three arrows on there, okay? So again, all we need to think about is, is it one arrow, two arrows, or three arrows? It's always three for a tidal set and drift, two for our ground track, and one for what direction did we point our boat, which is our water track, okay? So armed with this information, all we are simply now going to do is draw some triangles. We're gonna draw the lines, we're gonna draw some triangles and we're gonna put some markers on the end. But before we do that, you've gotta think, what we draw on our chart is in a true heading, what we take off our hand bearing compass is magnetic, and what we take off our boat is a compass bearing. So we need to have a think about how does that affect what we do? Now this I know looks super complicated and you're all thinking, holy moly, Kath, what are we gonna do with this? But it's actually quite simple. This is showing you the different variations around the world, okay? This was in about 2015. So we've got a few of these zero lines here, okay? The agonic zero lines. And basically anything in red is showing you as an easterly variation. <clears throat> anything in blue is showing you as a westerly variation. So if we look, we're pretty lucky, we're in between the zero and the two, so we don't have very much variation here at all, okay? Well, what if we were sailing, say, down in the, uh, <clears throat> in the ocean here? We'd be looking at at least 20 degrees, if not more. Each of these lines is done into two degrees, okay? So if we go sailing down in the Southern Oceans, and I learned to sail down in New Zealand and North Island, you're potentially looking at a difference between what you write on your chart and what your compass points to of around 20 degrees. And if we cannot get that going in the right order, potentially we're gonna be 40 degrees out, okay? So you need to understand your variation. And here's two compass roses, which is where we get our variation from. The one on the right, for those of you who studied any, um, let me just pop someone in. For those on the right, for anyone who studied the day skipper or the yacht master, you'll notice this is a traditional one that comes off chart three. <clears throat> and here we've got our westerly variation. Okay, so seven degrees, 25 minutes west in 2005, and it is moving eight degrees east annually. So it's marching back towards zero because it's moving east. So that's a fairly standard one. The one on the left here is off a New Zealand chart where we're actually 18 degrees, 35 minutes east different, okay? So this is already my compass is pointing almost 20 degrees different to what I'm going to put on my chart. So I'm going to have to reconcile that in some way. <coughs> Excuse me. I also need to worry about my deviation because as well as the magnetic uh, field around the earth affecting where my compass points to, Things on my boats so of ferrous metal, so engines, speakers, all that kind of thing, also affect my compass on board the boat. So none of my compasses are pointing to true north, okay? Unless my variation is absolutely zero. So how do we remember it? Well, for those who've done any tuition, you'll probably have heard your instructor say cadet, which stands for compass to true add east. And I'm gonna keep this really simple for you. If we wanna go from a compass bearing all the way to a true bearing so someone shouts a heading off the boat and somehow you need to draw it on the chart so you're going to have to convert it using <clears throat> a plus east or minus west okay so when you work out your variation and your deviation if we were going from compass here all the way over to true we would be adding an easterly variation or we would be taking away a westerly variation of course, there's also the times when you've done beautiful chart work on board your boat and you want to shout up to the helmsman what course you want them to steer. And we have to be able to go around the wheel in the other way. So if we're going from true, I've drawn it on my chart to what do I want my boat to steer? <clears throat> I'm looking at going the other way. So if you remember cadet compass to true add east, you can always draw that top line 
And once you've drawn that top line, you just have to draw the opposite on the bottom. Okay. And my top tip for all of my students, whether they're doing Essential Nav, whether they're doing Day Skipper or Yacht Master, is draw this on a little sticker and stick it on your plotter. That way it's always there. That is not cheating. That is just sensible. Okay. So <clears throat> what we also have is our magnetic in between. So we have our compass headings, we have our magnetic if we were using it just from a hand bearing compass and our true. And so we can go from a compass heading to what it would read on a magnetic scale all the way to what it would read on a true scale. Okay. And on this side, we have our deviation. So to change a compass heading into magnetic, we have to do the deviation calculation. And then to change magnetic into true, we have to do the variation. Okay. It's easier than it looks, but if you can get this wheel drawn onto your chart plotter, then that makes it much more simple for when you're doing your calculations. So here we go, activity. So hopefully you've got your pens and papers ready. Okay, a little bit of maths on a Tuesday night, I'll admit. Here's the smaller version at the top. And what I've done is I've put a grid down at the bottom. So this top line is we've got our true heading, and what we need to do is work out what the compass heading is. And on the bottom line here, we've got our compass heading and we need to fill in the blanks all the way back to our true heading. So have a look at the maths. If we've got a 90 degrees true here and we're going to compass, we're going around the bottom half of the circle. So we're adding west, uh, adding west and taking away east. If we're going from compass all the way to true, we're going around the top. So have a couple of minutes just to think about what would you put in those boxes? Okay, I'm just gonna pause the recording there while we, oh, there, there we go. Don't press the buttons or the answer buttons there. Okay, resume recording. Okay, so if we're starting on this side and we've got a true heading and we're moving to variation of seven degrees west, as we're heading around the bottom side of the circle, we're going to be adding that. So our magnetic heading would be 97 degrees magnetic. Okay, that would be great if we were steering on a hand bearing compass. But what if I actually want to ask my helmsman to use his compass on board the vessel? We would need to work out what the deviation was. We'd go to the deviation table. In this case, it's three degrees east. And so because we're still going around the bottom of that curve, we would be subtracting that to get a compass heading of 94 degrees compass. Okay, going back the other way, so say the helmsman said to me, well, I'm steering 002 degrees compass, okay, that's quite an accurate compass heading, but I'm steering 002 and you wanted to be able to plot that on your chart. First up, we need to work out the deviation. So the difference between two and going back around the top to 357 would be five degrees west, we'd be subtracting west. And then we'd have a variation, say, of three degrees east, and because we're still going around we're doing the variation now, we'd be adding it back to get a heading of a true heading of zero, zero, zero. OK, so how well did we do? Thumbs up if you got it right. Thumbs up. There we go. Have you say it's Graves pleased with himself. Ah, Marcus, well done. Your thumbs up. Oh, yeah, we've got a few thumbs up. Awesome. OK, so. <clears throat> If you have this written down, it just means that you don't need to think, okay? Because the last thing you want to be doing on a really bumpy sail when you're really tired is trying to remember, oh God, was it add, take away? I genuinely can't remember, okay? So that's how we do our true to compass. So how are we going to estimate our position? How are we going to use that to estimate our position? Well, an estimated position, an EP, is about something happening to your boat. It's saying, I sailed over there, the tide pushed me, therefore I ended up over there. Okay, so this is not about a course to steer, which we're gonna do on Thursday. How do I angle into the tide? This is my best course to win with was 90 degrees, and actually the tide pushed me this way, so where did I end up? Okay, that's my estimated position. So the first one I'm gonna do, just to give you an idea, has no leeway on there, okay? So I fixed my position, remember I said a fix was always a circle with a dot, I've also labeled it with um, my log reading. Okay, so here's my water track. <clears throat> so this is I've taken my compass heading, I've changed it into a true heading. Okay, and I said, you know, we think we, we sailed on whatever the heading was, I've turned it into my water track and I've plotted it. And I've done this as one hour of boat speed. So we think we traveled for one hour, let's say this is six knots. Okay, we'll be on a sailboat today. 
Once I've got my water track on there, I do my DR on the end of it. And I put my little one arrow because that's the where we think the boat went. That's where we headed the boat. Then I put my tidal set and drift. I need to go to my almanac. I need to work out the correct hour of tide. I need to go to the right tidal diamond or tidal stream atlas, work out what my hour of tide is. In this case, it's giving me a tidal set and drift that looks a little bit like this. And I plot it on the end of my EP. So I think I sailed there, but the tide has pushed me there. Okay. So on the end of my EP there, if I can pop my, oh, no, wrong way, there we go. I can now pop my symbol for an EP. So there's my triangle and I put EP at 1300 BST because this was one hour of boat speed and one hour of tide, okay? So that's my EP. Now, where did my boat actually go? Well, it didn't go down the water track because the tide was constantly pushing it. So actually, my boat went down this ground track line here. So if I walked along underneath my boat, all the way along the seabed, that's the path that I would be walking along, okay? So my EP, oh, a bit trigger happy today. My EP, I've got my water track and my tidal set and drift, and that's where I would estimate my position. And what actually happened was my boat sailed in that direction okay and that's where i don't worry about any leeway so let's say there's hardly any wind and i don't have to worry about the boat slipping sideways in the wind okay so what if there is a big wind then here we've got a nice southerly wind well because an estimated position is all about what happened to you we do the calculation so we'll say i've got my compass heading i change it to magnetic i change it to true so i've gone via my deviation i've gone via my variation to true and effectively i would have drawn my water track there because that's what my true heading would have been but the wind was constantly blowing us and if the wind was blowing us <clears throat> let's say we've got a force four force five it's on the beam so it's going to be pushing us sideways our boat's going to slip sideways we're actually going to track north of that line so if I estimate that we've got around five degrees of leeway, I would actually draw my water track five degrees further up. So you apply your leeway to your true heading because it's already happened. So here we would work out our true heading was 80 degrees true, roughly. And a southerly wind is pushing the boat north of track. So we would subtract the leeway because, of course, it's pushing us up around the compass back towards zero so we would need to take away the leeway so the water track that we draw is this solid blue line and we would draw it at 75 degrees true still for one hour of boat speed so whatever that happened to be 10 knots 6 knots 20 knots depending on what kind of boat you were in okay we do exactly the same thing now we pop our tide on tide set and drift so we would go to our almanac we would work out the correct hour of tide so high water for our standard port work out the correct hour of tide and in this case we'd be saying here's our one hour tidal vector and then we pop our ep on the end of it okay so in theory although we thought we were heading that way the wind was constantly blowing us that way and we put our leeway on onto the chart so we don't draw the two lines i can't quite rub that one out but we would just draw the solid blue line. So you would do all your calculations before you put your line on your chart. What does that mean? It means that my ground track, so in this instance, the whole triangle has just pushed a little bit further around and um, <clears throat> we would be putting our ground track on there. Okay, so uh, Jacob, uh, how do you know how much your boat leeway is? You have to sort of guesstimate. There are lots of clever ways where you can look behind your boat and you can look at the center line and how far off your wake is. It's effectively how far you are slipping. So depending on the type of boat you have will depend on the kind of leeway that you are going to use. It's not a bad thing to think about. A force four on the beam is probably five degrees. A um, bit more than that, so a four six, four seven might be about 10 degrees of leeway. But actually what you can do is you can plot your position and you can work out how far off that you are actually going to be. So it very much depends on the type of boots you have. Okay. So here's my plotting a projected EP because I can use exactly the same tactic to say, okay, let's say I can make this point of sale. So my best, um, I can beat to windward and my best point of sale is going to be 90 degrees. Or maybe I want to make my heading 90 degrees to go across a TSS. Okay, so traffic separation scheme. 
so I can project where I think I will go if I go on that heading. So if my helmsman tells me that the best course to steer that they can, or the best course that they can make, best course to windward to 90 degrees, and I put that on my chart after I've changed it into true, then I work out what the tide will do for an hour. I can work out that if we go in that direction on this heading, then the tide will push us there and we will end up here. Okay. Well, why is that important? Let's say, and you're going to use your imagination here, this is a sandbank, okay? Here is a sandbank and I've got two cardinals. I've got an easterly cardinal on one end and I've got a westerly cardinal on the other, okay? Let's say I wanted to work out how long it would take me to clear the sandbank. I can work out my projected EP and I can say, actually, we're going to sail down this line, not that line. So although the boat would be heading over there, it will always be being pushed up by the tide. So we would sail north of that particular hazard, okay? So that might be okay, it might not be okay. It depends on what it is we want to avoid. But let's say I wanted to know from a navigator's point of view, well, how long is it gonna take us to clear the sandbank, okay? And this is where we do a little bit more math. I'm afraid navigation is very much about math. If we wanna know how long it's gonna take us to get to say this point here, so if I just put a stamp on and say we want to get to that point there, put a nice little gold star where I want to get to, then what I have to work out is my distance to waypoint. So I work out how far it is from my fix to where I want to get to. And then I work out my speed over ground. <clears throat> so let me grab another arrow in a different color. My speed over ground is then not my boat speed anymore. My speed over ground is from my fix all the way to the EP because it's how far I have gone in that whole hour. So I think I've gone six knots, let's say, my boat speed, but the tide has also pushed me. So actually this red line here is going to be longer than my boat speed. My, my actual speed over ground would be faster than my boat speed. So once I can measure these, okay, and I've done some simple maths for you, I put my mouse back on. My ETA set, say this is four and three quarter miles. The actual speed over the ground is 7.5. I divide one by the other, times it by 60, and I would say that in 40 minutes time, I would be clearing this particular sandbank, okay? So it's a basic speed distance time triangle. So if you've done those before, so we're just looking at time being the distance to the waypoint here divided by the speed over ground. Now, could I, do I have to do that? I could look at it and go, well, do you know what? If that's the whole line, that's about halfway. That's about three quarters. So it's not quite three quarters, it's about 40 minutes. Equally, I could have a guess, okay? But I'm not a big fan of guessing, particularly if I can work it out, all right? So this is where I would project my EP to say, if we make this good course to windward of 90 degrees, the tide's constantly going to push us. Will we miss the sandbank? Yes or no. And at what point will we be past the sandbank? Okay. So that's what our projected EP can look like. So let me just clear off my drawings. And what I want to do is pause the share, grab a new share. I just want to put myself onto the chart plotter here and then I'm going to show you what it looks like. So if I click resume share, hopefully now you're all looking at the REA chart plotter. Yeah. yeah look at that. I'm getting the hang of this screen sharing after all. Okay. So to start with then I fixed my position and I fixed my position over here and I said let's say we've been out fishing for the day or something I don't know or we've been sat out here at 12 o'clock BST and we're going to work out an estimated position if we go on a particular heading back in towards say Bramhope Bay. Where does that end up? These I just put on the chart for now because I'm going to pick them up and move them in a second. So first up what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to go and get my line and I'm going to get my water track. So I'm going to draw my water track and I'm going to say, let's say we were heading over towards Bramhope Bay and we've gone on about 100 degrees true and we've done it for about, let's say, about six and a half miles. OK, so there's my water track. There's the single line on it. That's the first line that I draw onto my chart. OK, my dead reckoning, if I put it on the end there, I put my dead reckoning on the end. That's the same as me drawing the line and arcing it off at the end. 
So I've drawn one hour of boat speed, let's say it's about six and a half nautical miles and it's on 100 degrees. So that's the first line with that one try, with the one arrow on there. In order for me to get my estimated position, I need to go away, I need to work up what the tide is doing. So I go away and work up my one hour of tide. If I go and get my tidal vector, let's say my, in this case, my tidal vector was pushing us down and let's say it's about 200 degrees and it's about three quarters of a knot, something like that, okay? So I put my tidal vector on the end and what I can do now is go pick my EP up and I would draw on the end of that line there, my EP, and I would label it 1300 BST. So what can I say about my picture? I can say that we headed on 100 degrees true, so I've done my compass, magnetic true change to get my 100 degrees true onto here. I've got six, so six and a half nautical miles, so we went for an hour, the tide pushed us, we've actually ended up down here, okay? So although we thought this might have been a good heading, actually we've ended up south perhaps of where we want to go. And at this point, we would estimate our position and go, oh, that's not great. So actually maybe we might need to drop the sails, we might need to um, motor into Brampoke Bay, we're gonna need to change our course, okay? So if we want to work out what our ground track would be, in this instance, we can pop our ground track all the way down to our EP. And here, I can't quite zoom in on this one to show you, so you'll just have to believe me on the numbers. Our ground track was actually 106 degrees and 6.42 nautical miles, okay? So the tide has headed us a little bit, okay? It's meant that our speed over ground then, 6.4, isn't quite the 6.5 that we thought we were going to make, okay? If we take him away, and just delete him and delete that tide. Let me move my thing. So what would happen if we had a slightly different tide? Well, let's say we had a slightly different tide that was heading us a lot more. And maybe we had, I don't know, let's have a look at about a knot and a half of tide against us, about there-ish, okay? We would draw our water track, we would draw our tidal vector, and we would put our EP on the end of it, okay? And in this instance, we're gonna say, well, what, what's that going to have done to our speed over ground? Although we think we've been traveling at six and a half knots because we've drawn six and a half miles. Actually, if I now go and get my ground track, and I join the dots, <clears throat> I actually only have a speed over ground of five, nautical mile or five knots and a heading of 107 degrees true okay so it's all about triangles on an ep i can do more than one so if i just delete him and him and just say i make this line a little bit shorter so it doesn't matter about the actual uh lines if this was my first ep i could then pop a tidal stream vector on the end I could then say, well, that's where I estimate my position to be. I could pop another water track. I could pop another tidal vector on the end. Okay, and I would say then my EP, now the timing will be right, but you can add them together. Of course, there's already an area of uncertainty around here. So around this one here, I'm saying, I think that's where I would have been. Yeah, I think that's what would happen to me. And of course, what happens now is that the more uncertainty you have, the bigger the area of uncertainty. So this one's a little bit uncertain. This one's a lot more uncertain. Okay, But you can draw them where you add them together. Okay, So you can draw one and then another to estimate your position. Okay, So if I just clear those drawings, I'll just pause it a second. <clears throat> and the final one that I want to show you is about a projected EP. So we're off to a TSS. So if I resume the share now, hopefully what you can see is we've got the TSS here. If I just zoom out to give you a bit of context, on these charts we've got a Northern Territories here and we've got a great big TSS with a magic roundabout in the middle here, very similar to Dublin for the, uh, for the magic roundabout. <clears throat> okay. So if I pop it just about there, <laughs> okay, so in this instance, I want to sail across the TSS and I want to sail on a heading that is 90 degrees to the TSS. So I've already popped that in and that's the black line here. Okay, so I said so that I make sure my heading is 90 degrees. Okay, I'm going to look at 005 degrees true 
and I just say I'm making about six knots, so this would be a one hour plot. Okay, so I draw the line, which is my water track, so a single arrow there, all the way up, and that would be my dead reckoning. Okay, so this is saying if I have to sail on that heading in order to keep my heading at 90 degrees to the TSS, to the oncoming traffic, that's what I would have to make. So where's that going to put me? Well, in the same way as before, I would say for this hour of this day of this tide, I'm going to go grab myself a tidal vector. And let's say the tidal vector was doing about 120 degrees and about 1.5 <clears throat> knots in this particular hour. Okay. So effectively, I've lost my little EP. There he is. I'm going to get my EP and move him up. Okay. There we go. Effectively, I would estimate my position sitting around here, which means that my ground track, when I pop my ground track on, actually goes from my fix to my EP. So although my boat has been pointing in that direction, it's constantly been being pushed by this tide. And um, we've actually made a ground track across the TSS that's not at 90 degrees. But our boat would have been heading at 90 degrees. If we pop our boat on here, we would have been heading at 90 degrees to the oncoming traffic in both lanes, okay? Although we would have actually crossed it there. And what's really important here is I can say, okay, so what did that do to my speed over ground? Well, this line here is coming up at about 5.93, I think it is. So we've gone from a six and a half knot, well, six knot boat speed, I think it was, just let me grab the line with the arc again and measure it. We've measured it out to here, which has gone to five and a half. Okay, so our boat speed has dropped, our speed over ground has dropped from our boat speed to five and a half. Okay, and the most important thing, let me just get rid of him. The most important thing then would be to say, how long is it going to take me to get to this point where thankfully I can breathe a huge sigh of relief and I pop out of the TSS? Okay. Well, thinking back to the equation I had before, I've got my time equals distance to waypoint divided by speed over ground. So the distance to waypoint I'm going to measure here at, let's make keep it simple, is, is four nautical miles, okay? So in my text box here, I'm gonna say my distance to waypoint equals four nautical miles, okay? <clears throat> I also need to, if I just select that, go back to my spotlight. I also need to work out what my speed over ground is. So again, I'm going to measure it with an arc here. And I'm going to say, so my speed over ground is roughly 5.5. So in this instance, I'm going to say, if I can select it, and my speed over ground, let me put the text box on. My speed over ground is 5.5 nautical miles. Equals in there. Okay, <clears throat> so I've got the two things that I need. So now, if I want to work out how long is it going to take me, remember my equation was the time equals the distance to waypoint divided by the speed over ground, and then you're going to times it all. Let's add. You're going to times it all by 60. Here's the question for you then. If you've got a distance to waypoint of four and a speed over ground of five and a half, pop into the chat your answer for what you think the time to get to that point would be. So you're looking at how long it would get to that point. Okay. We'll see. I don't know what the answer is. I suppose I should work it out, shouldn't I? Let's have a quick look. So. Let's see if we can get any answers popping up in the chat. Nothing in the chat yet. Ah, there we go. So there's a few popping in. Nice. Let's call it. I like that, Lawrence. 43.636363. Let's call it 45 minutes. Yeah, I like that. Okay. So you're all getting the idea. Absolutely. So you're going to do four divided by 5.5. Remember, it's the speed over ground you have to use, not your boat speed, because it's how fast did you actually go times it by 60. Now, is that a sensible answer? Okay, yeah, 43. So 43 is the same answer I got, 43, 44. Is that a sensible answer? Well, I would say so, because this line here is one hour long, because you plotted an hour of boat speed, and you plotted an hour of tide. 
So actually this is one hour long and you're kind of 20 minutes in, 40 minutes in, it's a sensible answer that you're gonna come up with around 40 minutes or so. So you're going to be sailing for 40 minutes thinking, oh my goodness, my world is about to end. Look at all these ships coming. And after 45 minutes, you can go below and put the kettle on and congratulate yourself on a job well done, okay? Anyone sailed across the TSS or know exactly what I mean, particularly if it's a busy one. Okay. So you've got two choices with your EPs. You've got the one that we showed you earlier, which was about, I sailed in that direction. My best course to windward was this will I make the entrance perhaps of where I want to go because if I won't then maybe I might need to think about maybe not sailing on that heading maybe sailing on a different heading or at what point I might need to tack okay so if I just pause share that <clears throat> I come back to my slides I am hoping there we go, resume share. Are you seeing the slides or are you seeing the chart plotter still? Slides? Chart plotter? Chart, chart plotter. plotter. All right, thank you. Okay, let me just do a quick new share. I was getting, to, I thought it was going too well. There we go, okay. So what are we doing this evening? All right, so that's 45 minutes nearly. We did a quick, position, quick revision of some position fixing, a little bit about converting bearings from magnetic, also compass to magnetic to true plotting our dead reckoning position to start with, plotting an EP and estimating our position and estimating and applying the leeway to an EP, okay? Um, next sessions on Thursday is another free session, which is the navigation course to steer. So that's going to be a similar session to tonight, but looking at how do I make my boat go where I want it to go rather than be affected by the tide, which is what we've looked at. And we also have a paid session on Saturday, which is our radar essentials workshop. So we're looking at some basic radar fundamentals, a little bit of play with the stimulator, a little bit of plotting, and as much radar as we can get into three hours on Saturday morning. Okay. Um, if you've enjoyed the free sessions, I put the lifeboat sticker on there as well um, if you've enjoyed the free sessions then please feel free to donate some of your hard-earned money to the rnli um, i would be most grateful okay so what i will do is i will stop the share i will bring you guys all back in